Hi, I'm Wendy De La Rosa, and this is Great Question, where Wharton professors like me answer your burning questions. Our topic today is spending behaviors and personal finance. Our first question is a great question. It reads, my partner and I just moved in together. What's a good way to approach a conversation about money and splitting bills? The first thing I would recommend for you is plan it out. Have a financial date night. Put it on the calendar, buy some wine, put on some music. So let's just take a concrete example. We have person A and person B who love each other very much and started their relationship. But person A and person B have decided that person A is going to make all of the financial decisions, become the primary decision maker when it comes to financial decisions, handle all of the bills. And person B is just going to trust person A to make all of the decisions and sort of go along for the ride. They're responsible for other things in the household, but they've just relinquished some financial controls over person A. Well, what ultimately happens, and this is uh, shown with research by Adrian Ward and John Lynch, is that the financial knowledge for person A increases over time. And the financial knowledge for person B decreases over time. And so the gap in financial knowledge sort of increases as the relationship continues. So my recommendation is, as you're having this discussion with your partner, make sure you have an equal seat at the table. One of our followers asked a really interesting question. They asked, I am a bridesmaid in my friend's wedding. Help. Oh man, haven't we all been in that situation before? So let me start by saying that a lot of times we talk about setting boundaries as it relates to our relationships and our mental health, but it's really important for us to set financial boundaries for our financial health. So I encourage you to have this conversation with your friend to say, this is my financial boundary. This is what I can do given my budget, my income and my expenses. I'm willing to buy the dress, but I, I may not be able to afford to go to Aspen for the bachelorette. Can I Skype in and celebrate with you virtually? But it's your financial health. It's okay for us to set financial boundaries with our loved ones. Another follower asked, how can underprivileged communities learn about money management? And I think at the core of this question is this assumption that financial education can meaningfully change financial behaviors. That the issues that underprivileged communities are facing in terms of how they spend their money is something that we can teach away. When you think about underprivileged communities, it's important to understand the environment. When consumers come from underprivileged communities, they're also limited in their earnings capacity. We know that there's systematic injustices that keep people from earning what they should be earning. So as we talk about how can we help underprivileged communities, the most important thing I think in my mind is to create environmental changes that make it easier for them to improve their financial behaviors. There was one amazing study that showed when H&R Block automatically populated a lot of the fields in the FAFSA versus not, families were much more likely to apply for financial aid and attend college. Think about that. Defaulting information that we already have so that this complex form becomes simpler for families has a huge effect on someone's likelihood of enrolling for college. These are the types of interventions that we need to think about as we focus on underprivileged communities. Our next question is this. Over the past year, I've been saving up for a trip. While I was there, I couldn't enjoy it because I kept thinking about how the money I was spending could be better used for other things. Do you have any suggestions on how to just let yourself enjoy something, especially something you've been preparing for guilt-free? The way in which you spend your money can ultimately impact your happiness and you're spending your money in the right way. All of the research shows that when we spend money on experiences, it increases our long-term happiness. You're creating memories, meaningful and memorable experiences. And so if you ever are ruminating again about how you spent your money on this trip, just tell yourself, according to science, I'm spending my money in the best way possible to increase my long-term happiness. And what more can you ask for?
Our last question is this, what is the type of innovation that's needed to improve financial services? One of the things that I've been really focused on is how do we help local governments, state governments, and even our federal government become more efficient with our safety net. One of the papers I recently published essentially showed that a lot of money is being left on the table for families who need it. For example, we had over 9 million Americans not receive their stimulus check. And it was mostly elderly Americans, very low income Americans. Why? Because our government didn't have access to their bank account. So they couldn't automatically send money to these people. That's the type of innovation that I want to see. How can we improve not just our startups and our industry, but also our local and state governments so that we can help the people that need the most help in the most efficient way. And I think the best way to do that is through a creation of universal financial accounts. Thank you so much for submitting your questions. I had a great time. Now, if you wanna learn more, you can check out my TED series on TED.com called Your Money and Your Mind, where we focus on using behavioral science to help you improve your financial well-being.